Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Shrine of Our Lady of Good Health. As you can see, we're expecting a little bit larger crowd this evening, so I'm going to ask us to um, get comfortable and squeeze in a little bit so we can get more room, um, try to get as many people inside the building as we can. We do have extra chairs that we are planning on setting up outside, however, let's try to get people inside the building. So if we can squeeze together, I would truly appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, for those of you that might, might just have arrived and missed my earlier announcement, we have a first class relic of St. Faustina up here by the communion rail. You're welcome to come up and venerate it. If you have any religious articles and you touch them to it, it will become a third class relic. This is a first class relic of St. Faustina. This actually is a relic that will stay here at the shrine. And once uh, this week is over, we will be having her in the reliquary downstairs in the Apparition Oratory behind the Our Lady of Grace statue. Good evening. I'm Claire Campbell. I'm the Communications Director and Events Coordinator for the National Shrine of Our Lady of Good Health. I'm here to welcome you, so many of you who have come from near and far, so many of you who have met so many of you who have come from far, and also many of our locals who are descendants of those who were saved from the fire of 1871 here to celebrate one of the first graces of Our Lady of Good Health, who through her intercession to her son Jesus prayed us through the miracle of the fire. If we celebrate tonight, I have chills. I don't know about all the days, I have chills tonight. Um, in this 160th anniversary year of Mary's appearance here at Champion. I'm also here tonight to welcome and introduce Michael O'Neill of the Miracle Hunter. He's a graduate of Stanford University, a member of the Mary Lightning Society of America, and an author of several books on miracles. He is a very popular host on Relative Radio and a co-host of the television special Miracle Hunters and has an interview widely, both in Catholic and secular media. Last year, we worked with Michael O'Neill on a film about our miracles here at our Marian Apparition site called Miracles of Champion, after which Michael appeared on the third hour of the Today Show in March of 2018 to talk about the film and Marian apparitions throughout the world. We welcome him back to Champion tonight, welcome him home to Champion tonight on this most historic occasion and thank you for sharing it all with us. Michael? Thank you. It's good to be back home. It's good to be here. In the right over uh, to the shrine here today, I was told that it's been raining cats and dogs the last uh, few weeks, and today we have a little bit of a sun miracle uh, to uh, commemorate this special day. So. Happy to see that. Happy to be here with you again. I enjoy every time I'm up here and I have that same sense of peace that so many people report when they come to the shrine. And I'm so grateful to talk about tonight. We're talking about the fire miracle. And uh, people often ask the question, is the fire miracle unique? Have there been other Marian miracles, great intercessions that have happened throughout history? And the answer, of course, is yes. We're going to go over a couple of those in our presentation today. So before we get started, I think it's important to talk about Mary. Who is she? And uh, people look at the image of Our Lady Could Help, and they say that this doesn't look like the Mary that we're familiar with. She has blonde hair, after all. And we know that the, the Mary of Nazareth did not have blonde hair, at least we assume. And so when we answer this question, who is Mary, we have to first answer the question, what about all these different titles of Mary? Our Lady of Fatima, Lourdes, Guadalupe, Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Good Paul. And so when we look at these different occasions when Mary appears, it turns out that she appears as a mother. Uh, she may change her clothes, she might dye her hair, she might take on another language or another accent, but she's doing that to make her children comfortable and to connect with her and to show her love. So let's talk about who is the person Mary of Nazareth. And so what do we know about Mary? We come from a couple of sources. One of the sources, of course, is scripture. The Catholic Church teaches us about Mary. We look at art and literature for inspiration. 
You can also turn to private revelation, those things like apparitions throughout history that give us insight into the person of Mary. And of course, when we talk about miracles, whether legends, folk tales, traditions, uh, or real events, uh, these things all give us inspirations and connect us with the love of God. So when we look at Mary and her roles, she, is, she has the role of a mother, first and foremost. When Pope Francis talks about Mary, even when he talks about Mary in apparitions, he says, I see Mary as my mama, my mother. Uh, she is the mother of all of us. And so Mary is a good mother. She's a healer. She is the greatest architect in history, in my opinion. She has more churches uh, attributed to her than anyone else in history. She's a great dispenser of God's mercy. She's an intercessor for us. And sometimes she tells us when things are going awry. And it's a hero of calamities. And so, what do we know about Mary? We look at her in Scripture. We know of her most from the Gospels of Luke and of Matthew. And St. Paul doesn't even mention her by name, actually. And there are many unknown details of her life. Where she was born, for example. When and where she died. And of course, the controversy over the Dormition. Did she fall asleep? Did she actually die? Now, uh, there's, there's been a great debate over the years. And the Protestants will suggest that she had other children. And of course, that is a, uh, a point of debate uh, that's meant to the ages as well. Mary has very few spoken words. And we know of Mary uh, through the Gospels. And if you look at the Quran, there is more mention of Mary in the Quran than in our own Bible. And so, is she the woman of Revelation uh, as described? Well, there are people who debate either way, so uh, we, we don't know for sure, but uh, there is certainly a point of inspiration for us. So when we look at the church, the church gives us some insight into Mary. And we have the four dogmas of the church, and there's a fifth dogma being proposed, uh, but the four main dogmas currently. In 381, the Declaration of the Perpetual Virginity of Mary, in 431, she's declared the Theotokos, the Mother of God. In 1854, the Immaculate Conception. And of course, in 1858, was Bernadette Subaru, the visionary of Lourdes. She mentioned that Mary identified herself as I am the Immaculate Conception. This went a long way to proving those apparitions because it harkened back to that dogma just recently released. In 1950, the dogma of the Assumption was promulgated. And when we talk about the church, I looks at apparitions throughout history. We also get insights into the relationship between Mary and the church. And we have to go no further than art, actually, to learn about Mary. And she's been the inspiration in literature for many saints and many authors. You have to look at the Notre Dame Cathedral, the greatest church, perhaps, unfortunately, under construction right now. When I was there on pilgrimage with Father John Broussard, we got to see the outside. Uh, but, of course, there are many treasures inside, some of which were saved in that fight. And when we talk about uh, Mary as being the most depicted woman in the history of art, there have been more pieces of artwork done about the Virgin Mary than in any other person. And specifically, when you look at a lady Guadalupe, that is the single most reproduced image in the history of art, even more so than the Mona Lisa. Sometimes it's on a tattoo, sometimes on the hood of a car, sometimes on a candle, but it's everywhere. And it's just in Mexico this past year, and her image is ubiquitous. And of course, we learn from Mary in private revelation. What do we mean by private revelation? We draw contrast to public revelation, which are those things found in the Gospels. And that's where we learn of Mary primarily. But through the life of mystics, St. Bridget of Sweden, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, for example, uh, Marie Valtorta, these are all people who have had visions or inspirations about how Mary lived. And for people who follow my work on MiracleHunter.com, they know I do a television series with EWTN called They Might Be Saints. And the idea behind the show is following people who have lived a heroic life of virtue and are on the path to sainthood. And one of my favorite, uh, my favorite episodes was that of a woman, Sister Marie de Manda Grasse. She's a French nun who, uh, who grew up in royalty. She was very wealthy, but she gave it all away in order to uh, become a daughter of charity. But when she did so, she came across a book. It was a book by Clemens Furtano who had written about the life of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich and her visions. And in her visions, she said that Mary lived in Ephesus, Turkey, with St. John, and resided in a home there. And you were able to follow the directions written by St. Catherine Emmerich and written in that book. And, uh, and this nun actually decided that she wanted to go to Turkey. 
And uh, as fate had it, she was transferred to Turkey, and she went searching for the House of Mary, as was laid out in the book by Anne Catherine Emmer. And the book was very specific. It was like following a treasure map. It said, take this many paces here. It said, near this mountain and this river. And she followed those directions with the help of some explorers. And they found a house that was believed to be the House of the Virgin Mary. And it was so believable at the time that it was the House of the Virgin Mary that they had atheist archaeologists examine the house. They excavated underneath and found Christian artifacts and found it to be a first century poem. And, it was, and, and the bodies were buried not facing Jerusalem around the house, but they were in a circle. And that would have signified that it was a significant place. In fact, it was such a, a discovery that the popes at the time had taken the indulgence of the house in Nazareth and moved it to Ephesus because they believed that this, in fact, is the true house of Mary. And this comes to us through private revelation, blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. So we learn many things uh, from, from private revelation about the life of Mary. And so when we look at the Mary of history, we know of her as Mary of Nazareth, but these apparition stories throughout history give us further insight in our understanding of Mother of God. And these miraculous icons, these weeping icons, these wonder-working icons throughout history have also shown us her great heart in her as a mother. And so uh, we see Mary throughout history, not just in the scriptures, but beyond. One of the very special projects that I was able to be involved with in my time as the Miracle Hunter was a project for National Geographic. And you may have seen this, the December 2015 issue of National Geographic called Mary, the most powerful woman in the world. And for those people interested, I still have copies of that magazine. And I couldn't believe that there was such an article written about the apparitions of Mary and the cover story for National Geographic. It's a science and nature and technology magazine. And uh, believe it or not, they dedicated a whole issue to the apparitions of the Mother of God. So I'm so honored to be a part of that and to try to make sure the magazine didn't veer off too far and make this epic so too crazy. <laughs> and in the centerpiece of that magazine, they did a map. And this was my favorite part where they worked with me and they took my Miracle Hunter data. 2,500 alleged apparitions throughout history. And uh, 28 times the Vatican has uh, the local bishop has approved 16 times the Vatican has, has recognized them. And so we mapped them out in this beautiful map in the centerpiece. But that was such an such a important, important thing. And I couldn't believe that they had devoted that much attention to Mary. And so we see that Mary has appeared throughout history. She's interceded for us. And we're familiar with these famous cases, Lourdes, Fatima, and Guadalupe, these famous cases of Mary and intercessions where she's uh, aided her children who, who have come to her, who she's, they come to her in times of need. And so when we look at the miracles that, uh, through the intercession of Mary, there are some that are personal miracles, and there are some that are larger. The personal miracles, we can look at a place like Lourdes, for example, where there have been over 7,000 cures investigated as being remarkable by the International Lourdes Medical Commission. I was uh, blessed to be there just last week on a pilgrimage. I made a pilgrimage every year with the Father John Bersar from the shrine. And we traveled to a different place of miracles around the world. And we were in France and Belgium. And one of the stops on that trip is we went to Lourdes. They call it the Bernadette year over there, and that's why we went. It's the 175th anniversary for St. Bernadette. And one of the things with Bernadette is, is that uh, Mary appeared a number of times to this 14-year-old French girl. And it's absolutely amazing. If you've been to Lourdes, it's mind-blowing to see how much has sprung out of just a simple girl who could barely read. She couldn't write, and she, her education was very minimal. She was a sickly girl, and she was out gathering firewood for her family. And Mary appeared to her on that day and numerous days afterwards. And one of the dramatic scenes from that apparition is Mary said, get down on your hands and knees and start digging in the mud. And not only dig in the mud, but take a drink of the water and a bite of the grass. And I don't know, I think visionaries always run the risk of looking a little crazy, saying that they're seeing the mother of God. But can you imagine that scene? All these people who thought maybe she was see, truly seeing the mother of God. And then to see her down on her hands and knees digging in the mud. Well, she had great obedience to our lady and dedication. And sure enough, when she dug in the ground, a great scream came forth. And people began to bathe in the spring and claim miracles. And so there have been many miracles uh, through Lord where people have claimed the intercession of Mary. And there were so, so many miracles being claimed that they were being posted on the walls of the church. 
And the local church there said, we need to establish an official scientific inquiry because people are claiming all these wild things. Sure enough, it stands alone as the only marrying apparition site in the world that has a commission that investigates miracles. And the miracles are so extreme. They use the, the most difficult criteria possible, called the Lambertine Criteria, which, name, which is named for Prospero Lambertine, an Italian cardinal, born in the 1600s. And that's the same criteria that's still used in the church today. So when we look at the criteria, what's the condition that might be considered miraculous? It must be an instantaneous, complete, and lasting cure of a serious medical condition. It can't be a common cold that goes away just a little bit faster than you'd expect. And it has to be complete, so that means if you're blind in two eyes, you can't just get your vision back in one. It needs to be a complete healing, and it needs to be permanent. You can't get better for just a little bit, and then the disease comes back. It doesn't work that way. And also, we all go to our doctors and get medical treatment, but these are cases where there has been no medical treatment that relates to the cure. So cases before surgery, or if the treatment didn't work, these are the cases that they consider. And just this past year, they had the 70th uh, miracle of Lourdes that was officially approved and declared. And in that miracle, there was a nun. Her name was Sister Bernadette. That's a pretty good name for a Lourdes miracle, I would say. <laughs> she had a severe uh, spinal condition. She had a number of surgeries, and she was unable to walk. Well, she went to Lourdes, and she bathed in the water. And uh, she came away from that water being able to walk. And the very next day, when she returned home, she walked five kilometers in celebration of that miracle. And this is the kind of miracle that they proclaim as being beyond natural explanation. I've spoken to a medical doctor at Lourdes, and I've said, tell me a story of a case that wasn't quite a miracle, that seemed pretty good. And he said there was a woman who had uh, gone to Lourdes, and she was, she was blind. And her one wish was that she would see her grandchildren and be able to pray a rosary with them on one day. And then she told Mary, you can take my vision away, but I just want this special thing on this one day. Will you please grant me this? She approached that water in faith and walked out with perfect vision, 2020. And she prayed, she prayed the rosary with her grandchildren that day and for the rest of her life. It seems like a miracle to me, doesn't it? But the Catholic Church at Lourdes didn't call it a miracle because the pathology in her eyes, whether it was macular degeneration or something else, had not restored. She was seen perfectly with broken eyes, which is kind of a miracle, but they didn't declare it a miracle. So it's absolutely amazing that this is the type of thing that uh, doesn't get counted at Lourdes. And so uh, the healings at Lourdes are, are, are one of the famous places of Marian intercession for personal miracles. And then we have the guidance of the saints throughout history. There have been various saints who have prayed and received the vision of Mary. St. James in Saragossa in 40 AD, according to the story, he was having difficulty spreading the gospel. People weren't listening to him, and he was despairing. And sure enough, the mother of God, Mary, appeared to him and comforted him. You might say, well, 40 AD, let's do a little math. Mary is still alive at that time. How is she appearing? Well, maybe it's a case by location rather than a true apparition. But in either case, she came to comfort. St. James in his time of distress. There have been cases where Mary has shown herself to be a sorrowful mother. And I don't know about you, but one of the hardest things in life is to see your own mother cry. So when Mary shows us her tears, that brings us to conversion and to ask what we can do to change our lives, to change the situation, to, to warm her heart in those situations. So there are stories like Our Lady of La Salette, where she appears as a woman crying to those children. Then there's the cases like the weeping statues, like in Pops, New Mexico, just this past summer. In New Mexico, they declared a statue that had been wet four times without natural explanation. One of my favorite stories in Syracuse, Italy, in the 1950s, there was a couple who had just gotten married, and they got this image of Mary as a wedding gift, and they hung it on the wall. And they, uh, they weren't necessarily a practicing family, but they began to pray to Mary, and the woman had gone through some serious conditions she had lost her sight, and they prayed in front of this image, and her sight regained, and she opened her eyes, and Mary's tears were falling down. In this particular case, the church investigated, they extra the statue, they sampled the tears which were human tears, and even the Pope looked at it, and he went on Vatican Radio, and declared that this is truly a miracle of the tears of Mary. And you get nothing better than the Pope, the Pope being on Vatican Radio, announcing something a miracle, you need no other sign of approval. 
And when we talk about churches, Mary's the greatest architect in history. There are so many cases where she appears and she says, you know, I'd like, I'd like you to pray, I'd like you to sacrifice, I'd like, to, I'd like you to drop closer to my son. And she often says, by the way, building a church. So many of the churches in, in Europe, for example, are the product of Marian apparitions, where Mary has asked for a church in Thanksgiving for a cure, perhaps. The most famous example, in my opinion, is that of St. Juan Diego, the visionary in 1531 in Mexico. He was a middle-class worker who got the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe emblazoned on his tilma, his cloak, and he showed it to the local bishop-elect, who then built the church in honor of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And of course, she told him, you know, show him the sign, build the sun, build the church, that my son might be made manifest. So these churches, of course, are not just personal miracles, but miracles for everybody who experiences God through them. Mary, like a good mother, oftentimes comes bringing gifts. She shows up, uh, in the case of St. Juan Diego, she gives that tilma to him. We have the case of uh, the miraculous medal. I was uh, honored to be there on this past pilgrimage. We went to the place of the miraculous medal, uh, where we saw where St. Catherine Labore saw several visions of, G- of Mary. And in that case, uh, she was given the design for the miraculous medal. And with that design, she became, it became the most popular medal in all of circulation in Catholic medal history. So uh, absolutely incredible when Mary comes bringing gifts. And uh, when, when you go to uh, that place of the miraculous medal, you can see the body of St. Catherine Labore lies incorrupt, as does the body of, uh, of St. Bernard Subaru in the bear. We were honored to be able to see both of those things. And so there are times as well when Mary appears giving some kind of guidance. She comes uh, in these cases throughout Europe where she asks people to return to the faith and to change their lives uh, throughout history. There are many stories of personal miracles where it's not a message for the world like Fatima, but a message for that local person or the town. And so when we talk about bigger Marian miracles, what about the cases where people have sought out Mary and they've asked Mary to intercede? Does she just come when she wants to or does she come when she's asked? Well, there are some incredible moments throughout history. For example, there's, there have been moments when in the time of great need in Ireland, they're going through a potato famine, they're going through the land war in Ireland, and Mary appears at not to at least 15 people, and she appears in silence, and her visions there unite the people, and uh, Ireland becomes stronger due to the intercession of Mary. And in Egypt, a Coptic apparition, I don't know if you've heard of this, Our Lady of Zytun, I encourage you to go on to miraclehunter.com and check out Zytun, because you can see an image of Mary walking on the rooftop of St. James Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt, and it was witnessed not by just a couple people, but by thousands of Christians, Jews, atheists, and Muslims. And this was captured on live Egyptian television. And it was so, it was so interesting because they turned off the power to the town in order to prove that this was a hoax, that it was a projection, and people could still see Mary. And you can see people of all faith traditions gathered today. And even in Egypt today, you can find people who have witnessed this and say this was an incredible miracle of Mary. And when we talk about uh, these occasions where Mary has helped nations. We talk about Our Lady of Pont Main, for example. 1871, and on the past pilgrimage, we went there as well. We had to take a special trip an hour west to the west coast of France in order to see this place. It's absolutely incredible because it's a tiny, sleepy little town, and then jutting off to the top is this giant Gothic cathedral with incredible blue stained glass windows. It was quite the sight to see. But why did they build a church there? It's because in 1871, it was in the midst of the Franco-Prussian War, and Paris was about to fall uh, to the Prussians. And the people in that local area were so afraid that their town in France was going to be destroyed that they gathered and prayed for the Virgin Mary, prayed for the Virgin Mary. And when they did, uh, with the soldiers approaching their town, Mary appeared in a blue dress with a white red cross and she appeared with a sign drawing people closer to Christ. And they gathered for some time. And at that very time, before she went away, the soldiers who were advancing on that town to take it over saw a vision of Mary in blue in the sky. And the Prussian commander, according to the record, said, we see the mother of God in the sky. 
your country is protected, and we're going to turn back. And the war ended several days later through the intercession of Mary. So this is an absolutely incredible thing. And the church approved these apparitions, and it's one of the most famous cases. And I've got a chapter of it in my new book, Mary, Virgin Mother, and Queen. We have other cases as well, like the Battle of Lepanto. We just celebrated yesterday the Feast of the Our Lady of the Rosary. Does anyone know why? It's because of the Battle of Lepanto. On October 7, 1571, there was a group of or the Christian forces defeated the Muslim forces, the Turkish forces, in an incredible uh, uh, underdog victory. All of, the, all of Europe was gathered, the Holy League was gathered in praying the Rosary. And it was such an unexpected you know, win for the Christian forces that the Pope, he saw a vision of victory, Pope Pius V, and he declared victory even before news got back because this was an incredible thing. And if it had changed, we would not be here today. All of history, all of Christian history would have been different if in fact the Christian forces were defeated. And on that ship, the, jet, the, the, the captain of the ship, Don Juan, he gave everybody a weapon. Not only did he give them swords, he gave them each a rosary. And they all prayed the rosary on the ship as they fought that battle. So this is one of the very classic cases of Mary intercession. And I'll leave you with one final example. And I'm looking forward to a pilgrimage in June to Canada, where we're going to be going to Notre Dame du Cap. And that is the most famous place of Mary and miracles in all of Canada. There's a story of two men having witnessed a statue of the Virgin Mary, which was moving. And that became the famous title of Mary, Notre Dame du Cap. Due to that miracle, the man who saw it was unable to walk and he was healed. They were trying to build the church there at the Notre Dame du Cap place, and they couldn't get the building materials across the river. And in the middle of winter, they hit, and they could not do anything, and they prayed the rosary on a daily basis for a solution to their problem of unable to be, get the materials over before the end of the season. And sure enough, a bridge of ice, according to the legend, formed such that they were able to move the materials across the way and therefore build the Notre Dame du Cap Basilica there. So this is one of the most incredible cases of Marian intercession. Maybe it was just a case of the weather turn. We don't really know. But this is one of the cases that is celebrated as people beseeching Mary for assistance and uh, her coming through for them. So I encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities, these examples for inspiration. Turn to the Mother of God in your time of need. Uh, she doesn't turn us down. Pray the miraculous medal or pray the miraculous medal, pray the rosary. Turn to Mary. But these uh, examples and examples from our own lives can be points of inspiration and inspiration as we go closer to Christ and the Mother of God. Thank you so much for your kind attention, and I'd love to answer any questions you have tonight. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, in front. Did you ever feel the presence of Mary? The question? Did you ever feel the presence of Mary? The question that Trump had is, have I ever personally ever felt the presence of Mary? And uh, I'd say, yes, that's true, I have. I've traveled to many Marian sites throughout the world, and each of them have their own special, special feel to them. And I have to admit that coming to this shrine in particular, I feel a sense of peace unlike any other place that I've visited in the world. So it may not have the giant basilica like Lourdes yet, but, uh, but the sense of peace here and the connection to Mary is very strong. I have, and I have to say, on a personal note, I was once praying the rosary, and I, I experienced this scent of roses. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I'm a skeptic as much as I am a believer. I say that a lot on my radio show. But in, in that moment, I searched around for somebody who had opened their perfume or opened their rosary beads and had the, the rose scent on them, and I couldn't find it. But it was no question that I smelled roses and a meaningful moment for me. So that was a little touch from heaven from my point of view. Did I make it up? I'm not sure. But, uh, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's what I like to remember is a moment I'm very close to Mary. Thank you for your question. Another question, please. Yes, over here. How did you become the miracle hunter? That's a great question. How did I become the miracle hunter? Well, I, uh, I probably have to chalk it up to my own mother, who 
who's actually sitting here in the audience. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mother, for your work. Uh, she, had, she had a great Mary devotion and great love of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So uh, she, uh, she always taught us every December 12th the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so growing up, I always had a special interest in miracles because of my own, my own mother's personal Marian devotion. And it was when I got to college that I decided to try to take an archaeology class and write a paper. And can you imagine what I wrote, wrote the paper about? And the professor said, write about an artifact in the history of the world that's had an impact. That shows the tilma of our lady of Guadalupe. And it was all that time spent with the tilma, uh, learning about it, and beyond just a childlike fascination with it, it was something that, uh, that was important to me, our Lady Guadalupe. And I said to myself, someday when I grow old, I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to learn about miracles because this is fascinating. And I was getting a nice uh, engineering degree from Stanford and I said, I'm going to become an engineer and come back to this when I'm old and gray. And maybe I'll look at miracles. Well, things happened a little faster than I was planning because near graduation I got some advice from Condoleezza Rice who was the vice provost at Stanford where I was. And she said, uh, what are you, you going to do after you graduate? And, you know, I didn't, I didn't quite know which job I was going to take, but she said, it doesn't matter if you know what you're going to do or don't know what you're going to do, whatever you do in life, become an expert in something. And, you know, I, I was ready for an engineering career. And she said, you know, I am an expert in one tiny aspect in one year of Czechoslovakian military history. I know more about this one tiny thing than anyone else in the whole world, I guarantee it. She said, find your sliver of the universe and own it. And that piece of golden advice has been ringing in my ears ever since that day. Because I said, you know what I'd love to be an expert in is miracles. And so shortly thereafter, I registered the website miraclehunter.com, and it's been, a, uh, it's been a long road. And uh, at first, I didn't let anybody know I was doing it. I didn't tell my parents, my family, or friends. It's kind of a secret thing because it's kind of strange, right? So <laughs> I didn't really tell anybody. And when people would interview me or, or email me, I would sign an MH Miracle Hunter. And I didn't put my name on the website because I didn't want anybody to know. I had a reputable engineering job, and I didn't want people to know I was crunching numbers by day of engineering principles and crunching numbers on apparitions at night. <laughs> and so, but eventually, I got so many requests for interviews, offers to write books. Dr. Oz called eventually, and Megan Kelly, National Geographic, that um, I might not be the world's expert in miracles, but I'm getting it. And so that's, that's my path. That's my path. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Another question, please. Any questions about miracles you've heard about? There you go, right here. Uh, can you visit Athena, our way of Athena, and where are your thoughts? So the question in the middle here is, what about Our Lady of Pizza? Have you visited it, and what are your thoughts? I have not yet visited it, and I am planning a pilgrimage there on uh, 20, in 2023, which is a few years from now, of course, but it's the 50th anniversary of the, the events at Akita. And for those people who don't know about it, it is truly one of the most fascinating supernatural events that's happened in church history. And it's complicated, just like all these things are, it's complicated, but I'll give you the short recap. There was a nun, Sister Agnes Sessagawa, in 1973. She was deaf, and she was called by a light uh, to the chapel in her convent. She arrived there, and she saw a vision of an angel. And uh, that angel pointed her to a wooden statue in the form of Our Lady of All Nations, which is a famous devotion from Amsterdam. And over the course of 101 days, that statue wept human tears and bled human blood. And Sister Agnes Sesagawa had messages of Mary appearing in for her, coming to her. And they investigated that statue, and the science behind it shows they were human tears, human blood. And that blood and tears did not uh, correlate with anybody else in the room. And what's complicated about Akita, and I won't go too far with it, and you can finally read the whole story on MiracleHunter.com, but the messages of Akita are dramatic. Some, some people say they're apocalyptic. 
But the thing about Akita that's very pertinent to today's world is that one of the predictions in the messages is that bishops will turn against bishops, cardinals will turn against cardinals. And we're living in some time like that, if you ask my point. Uh, are the messages of Akita all easy to digest or accept? No, they're very difficult. Are we guaranteed that each message is 100% true? I don't think we are. But it's certainly not worthy. The science is undisputable, and the messages certainly correlate to a lot of what we're seeing. And so I look forward to going there in a few years for the 50th anniversary, or sooner, if somebody sends me over there. So, uh, <laughs> but, but what does it mean? It, it just means that we don't have to get wrapped up in the prophecies. We don't have to get wrapped up even in the phenomena. But it has to remind us that when we see our mother crying, we don't need to point at what everybody else is doing wrong. We need to look at our own lives. And we have to see it in our closer Christ. So, a uh, great question about Akita. Read more on our website if you want more information. But in my opinion, it's one of the most fascinating cases there are. Thanks for that great question. Another question, please? Yes, in front. Did you mention anything about the glory You missed it. So, the question in the front. No, I did, you didn't miss anything. So in this particular presentation, I did not mention the name Medjugorje. And I appreciate the question. Normally, it's question number one. This time, it's number four. So um, for those people who don't know what Medjugorje is, you might be living under a Catholic rock of some sort. But, uh, but I'm glad you're here today. I can tell you a little bit. So uh, Medjugorje is by far the most uh, well-known, interesting, controversial miracle that's being claimed in our world today. And uh, the background of the story is, is 1981, six children in war-torn Yugoslavia began to claim visions of Mary. And in most Marian apparitions, the data shows that Mary appears approximately six times, sometimes more. And in the case of Medjugorje, she has allegedly appeared on each and every day since 1981 to this current day. And you don't need to be a math major to figure out that's thousands of messages. And it's had an impact on the world. People, I guarantee there's people in this room who have been there. I guarantee there's other people who will go. But there have been over 35 million people who have gone to Medjugorje to see what's going on. People report miracles. People report the sun spinning. People report all kinds of things. But what does the church say? Is this an authentic phenomenon? And if it is, it's pretty interesting, right? Because Mary would be appearing in our world today. And so, well, let's look at how the church has looked at this. So, the way that it works, according to a 1978 document called The Norms of the Congregation for Proceeding and Judging Alleged Miracles, or Private Revelations and Apparitions, in that document, which was sent to all the bishops of the world in Latin, it says, the local bishop is the first and foremost authority in a Marian apparition case. If he can't handle it, then the National Bishops' Conference gets the hot potato. And if they can't handle it, then it goes to the Pope and the bed. There's been only one case in apparition history that's escalated all the way up from the level of the bishop to the Vatican, and that case is Medjugorje. So what has the local bishop said? Two local bishops not only gave it the, didn't give it a maybe judgment, they gave it the most negative possible judgment. Constante non supernaturalitate, which means it is established as not supernatural. It's definitely not supernatural. So two bishops gave that judgment, which normally will shut down an apparition. But the people kept coming from all over the world. And so in 1991, the bishops of Yugoslavia, it's not Yugoslavia anymore, but the bishops of then Yugoslavia formed a commission. They studied the message of Medjugorje. And they did not say no, they didn't condemn it. They said, Maybe. And Pope Benedict in 2010, before he retired, he set up a commission called the Ruini Commission, made up of 30 theologians, historians, Mariologists, psychologists, historians, to interview the visionaries of Medjugorje. Pope Francis retired. Pope Benedict retired. Hot potato went to Pope Francis. That report has been completed. It is in the hands of Pope Francis. And I was in Fatima on May 13th. 2017 for the, the Fatima uh, 100 year seminar. On May 14th, the day after, the Pope was on a plane ride back from Fatima and the 
recorder, ask him a question. He likes to answer questions on planes. I wish he wouldn't do that, but he doesn't. So the reporter said, Pope Francis, Fatima was great. How about Medjugorje? What do you think? And, he, and this is what Pope Francis he said. He said, I have to report on my desk, and it is very well done. However, I do not see Mary as somebody who appears every single day and gives messages at a certain time of day. That's more like a postmaster to me, not like the mother of God. He said, however, in the report, it says that the first seven visions of Medjugorje are authentic, or are worthy of belief. And the remaining 35 plus years are unknown. Some of the commission gave it a negative judgment, some of the commission gave it a positive judgment, some of the commission gave it a maybe judgment. So they said it needs further study. So what is Pope what Francis going to do? Well, he's in a tough spot because he's like an umpire in baseball. You call it a ball, half the crowd boos you. you. Call it a strike, half the crowd boos you. So it's a highly controversial apparition. Many people are interested. Will the Pope approve the first seven, condemn the rest of the 30, 35 years? I don't think he can. Why not? Because in that 1978 document, it says the moral character of the visionary is important for a vision to be considered authentic. So if somebody's lying about visions for 35 plus years, that's not good moral character, that's lying. So that's complicated. But what's going to happen next? Some people say maybe nothing though, because they just, for the first time in history, approved official pilgrimages to Medjugorje. Previously, those were banned. But as of right now, you can go to Medjugorje on an official pilgrimage. Maybe they won't make any kind of judgment. But baked into the apparitions is proof in the pudding. In those apparitions, it says each of the visionaries has released, received 10 secrets, and they will release those secrets when they all have 10. And there will be a permanent sign for the whole world to see on the apparition hill. So, if there's no sign on the top of the hill, they're fake. If there are no secrets, fake. But if there are secrets and there is a sign, true. So, how's that for a cliffhanger? <laughs> we'll see what happens, and I have no idea. And that's all I'm going to ask, ask for answer for today. Tomorrow I'll be back, so please come back to the shrine and answer any, any questions that you have for me. Thank you so much.